Welcome to the Peace Over Pain podcast with Dr. Kevin Reese, where we examine the body as a whole unit and move people from health burdens to health miracles. So get your questions ready, because the show starts now. Good morning and welcome to the Peace Over Pain podcast. It is July 26, 2022. I'm your host, Joe Lachance, and I'm here with the author of Peace Over Pain, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. Welcome, Dr. Reese. How are you doing today, buddy? Happy New Day. Our heat wave here in Connecticut is now over. Oh, very good. Congratulations. I hope after the show, you go out and enjoy the beautiful weather because I know I'm going to. Yes, indeed. So Good, good. Well, before we get started, I just wanted to remind people that we will be taking your questions at around 1030. So if you have a question for Dr. Reese, please leave it in the comments. Or if you want, if you're bold, click on the Zoom link in the description and you can come live on air with us. So uh, let's hope some people take up that offer. Um, But we always get a few good questions every week. So um, it'll be good. All right. So, so last week, we talked about the poor four. um, And we went over that. So I think this week, we wanted to discuss victimhood, and the poor four mental behaviors because besides the four four, four foods there are poor four mental behaviors yes so and and it just happens that victimhood is is one of them yes so we might as well talk about all four and how they relate to each other and before we do talk about this we are not talking about um if you were a victim let's say of a crime or a victim of a sexual assault, because there is real victimization that goes on there of humans. And uh, I don't want to, you know, down that at all. But um, I think that's more of something for a PTSD discussion. Mm-hmm. What we're talking about here on today's show is a, a victim mentality, basically. Yeah, so, some people might call it victim oriented thinking victim oriented thinking okay so we got that clear before we just focus in on the victim oriented thinking what are these poor four mental behaviors worrying Mm -hmm. victim oriented thinking approval seeking and escapism Okay, so I think all those deserve an explanation. <laughs> so <laughs> let's so start worrying, with number one. Worrying is when we project to the future. And it creates, it's like your analysis, it's analysis of something that hasn't happened yet. Right. You know, it's over there and you're worried it's coming here. Or... You know, whatever, there's a difference between being prepared and worrying. Right, right. You know, like, you can prepare for a tornado. It's different right. than worrying about the tornado. Yeah, and it's it's one thing about thinking about the worst case scenario when you're trying to do something, because you always try to think of the scenario outcomes. But I think that's part of planning. I think what you're talking about is like, almost it's um the neg- projecting the negative outcome in any situation pretty right. much you know what i mean so focusing on what you don't want to happen right thereby manifesting it yeah <laughs> instead of focusing on the way you would like to see the outcome be yeah. which is co- the opposite. So worrying is kind of negative projection into the future, you know, where rather than I think the opposite would be positive projection into the future. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And, um, how, and then the next victim oriented thinking, right? Yeah. That's, that's just basically where it's always, well, it's, it's sort of a, woe is me type of thing it's complaining and or blaming and it's constant 
And when someone gets locked into victim oriented thinking, they they go into complaining and blaming all the time. It, it could be over something very small too. Right. It could be there's no parking available downtown. And you're like, son of a gun, you know, it's the mayor, the mayor, you know, in the, the, you know, God, they like to blame God. (laughs) Sure. God, or, or this always happens to me and blah, 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 blah. And, and it's just, you're, you're just really harming yourself. Really? Well, again, you're manifesting these things to have, Oh, this always happens to me. Oh, okay. Well, well then it'll always happen to you then. Right. But the, the other, the other thing is, victim oriented thinking is a way of deflecting taking responsibility for yourself well here's what i notice about victim oriented thinking first of all they're never wrong it's never their fault and you will never get an apology from a victim oriented thinker because they're never wrong so even if they know they did something wrong to you believe me i deal with them they they will not admit it and then when they see you again they'll act like nothing happened um so these are just little subtle things i know i've known about victim oriented thinkers because i've had interactions with them you know and and yeah i don't know about i don't know about all of them no but but the ones i've dealt with let's put it that way right right because some people what happens is they also suffer from guilt syndrome Mm -hmm. and so they go into victim mode and then, you know, three hours later, then the guilt hits. Right. And then they're, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. But it's a cycle. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, it is a cycle. And it's it's a program. It's a loop that people get stuck in, basically. All right. So number three. Approval seeking. Okay. And this is the big one I struggled with. It's, it's when you're looking for the pat on the back. You're looking for respect. Like, hey, look at me. I'm doing great over here. You you should acknowledge that. Acknowledge me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Roman Reigns catchphrase from WWE. It's it's perfectly, it's the perfect, yeah. It's acknowledge acknowledgement. Recognition and acknowledgement is the preferred drug of the mm. evening. Oh yeah, absolutely absolutely and okay and the last one it's escapism and that could be drugs alcohol but most of the time it's television media yeah media you know the phone it, it's avoidance it's i don't want to deal with this problem so i'm going to stuff it back down And instead, I'm going to binge watch Breaking Bad or something, you know? Yeah, no, no, no. I know exactly what you mean. And unfortunately, it's prevalent in this society. Um, And it certainly shows, you know? So, okay. So now how do we change these behaviors? Let's say, you know, we're doing our thing. We're going through the program. We're doing our thing. And we we say, okay, I've identified the fact that I engage in escapism a lot. Yeah. So how do I change that behavior? How do I reprogram a new behavior in there? Because it's all about reprogramming the mind, right? Yeah, there's a lot of wounds. Wounds of the heart or pain body, sometimes we call it. There's a lot of wounds that need to be healed. And until we heal, these behaviors usually stay. And I I think our mindfulness coach, Mark Pelter, will be able to elaborate on this in a few minutes. But it's it's like when we get into our inner self, our inner child, and we start healing, the behaviors start slowing down. I mean, you have to be aware of the behaviors first. (laughs) If you don't know you're doing it. You identify, you have to identify them. Yeah, if you don't know you're doing it, then you're unconsciously acting out these behaviors. Right. So knowing, having the awareness that it's happening and then catching it every time you do it and being like, oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm worrying about something that's next week and 
it doesn't even matter. It's not right. real. Right. You know? Because these these four four mental behaviors, they're not real. They're just the they're mind. like programs. They're, they're you're you you've almost like identified a program loop, you know. <laughs> right. This is a certain one that tends to have these characteristics. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you've identified a certain program, you know. Um, sure. You know, and then now we got to talk about how okay, you want new software. We want new programs and you know, how do we substitute replace they always say you got to take an old habit the best way to get rid of an old habit or an old program is to replace it with a new one sure the law of substitution right nature abhors a void right so, so if you catch yourself worrying you can bring yourself back to the present or or you can switch the thought to something positive right you can imagine yourself dancing and laughing and playing Right. And I think the fact of catching yourself doing these behaviors is the real key yep. because before they were all automatic. It's just, you did it like, cause your mom did it. You know, you see your mom, there worrying all the time or your dad worrying about bills or whatever. You think that's normal behavior. So this is a program that's installed when you're a kid, you know what I mean? It comes down through generations and and sometimes identifying it is the hardest part but that's where you say you have to become the watcher and and be almost that third person who watches what goes on in your mind almost you're almost like watching the little chess game that goes on in there and it, and it becomes very interesting once you can get you know you can get the hang of that but okay now i would say in my opinion out of the four behaviors that victim oriented mentality yeah. is probably the hardest for somebody to recognize in themselves wouldn't you say that yeah it might it might be i don't know escapism too well, that's pretty easy. You know, if all you got to do is ask somebody how many hours they spend on a TV. And, and then they, once you get them thinking, oh, wow, that might be too much. That 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 might be a little bit easier. Or their phone or their phone. Oh, the phone's the worst. Yeah. The phone is the worst. I mean, you could spend hours, and hours on Instagram or TikTok. You really right. can. You just oh, I, I had to delete all social media off my phone. And TikTok's the worst. That can take you into a hole. I don't know how they do it, but it's it's more addicting than any of the others. It's, <laughs> it's instant entertainment. You're getting something for a minute, and then a minute, yeah. and then a yeah. minute, and then it's on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. So escapism is a big one that's very prevalent in this society, and I believe victim-oriented mentality, unfortunately, has become more prevalent. I mean, would you agree with that? um at least in certain segments of the population uh than it was say 30 years ago i don't know i was only like 12 30 years ago so i'm not oh, sure okay well i guess i i can <laughs> i can judge on that <laughs> <laughs> i was only 13 how's that but no uh but no i've just noticed that it's kind of prevalent so how does one how does that develop in a person the victim oriented mentality. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's a, everything can probably be traced to mom and dad, mm -hmm. but it's all about not getting your way. And when you don't get your way going into some sort of temper tantrum. So, right. A right. Lot of only I'm an only child. So certainly there's, that temper tantrum mentality of, or that temper tantrum behavior or reaction. And then it becomes a, you know, what the heck? Why does this keep happening to me? It's a non-acceptance, mm. you know? Yeah, thinking that outside forces have something to do with what happens in your life. You know, I think, you know, part of what, would probably what helps people snap out of some of these behaviors, um, I guess, would be um, 
you know, actually realizing that their thoughts create their reality. I think that realization for a person, you know, because most people don't, that's like the basic. Yeah. Like once you've realized that your thoughts create your reality. It's heaven and hell. It's heaven and hell. And then you can discern. Which, of course, in the book, I describe as Santa Claus and Michael Myers. Right. And we discussed that on the, on the mindfulness show. Right. And you got to kind of be able to discern who's coming, you know, which, which one you're, you're listening to, you know, is it ho, 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 or, ah, ah, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you want presents or you want a knife? You tell me, (laughs) what would you rather have? Just make sure you leave out some cookies. That's (laughs) right. Yeah. All right. So, um, no, I think we've covered this pretty well, but the bottom line is first you have to identify these four behaviors. Yeah. If, if you have one of them and, and don't get, there's more too. Oh yeah. These are the poor four, the top ones that you've, you know, discerned here, but there are other program loops that people experience, um, you know, that, that we could discuss on another show. But they're, you know, they're a little bit different. So, but these are the main ones. Okay. So, um, you want to bring on Mark, but before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsor here. Our sponsor is always the book, right? (laughs) Yeah, let's do the book right now. People need to read it. Yeah, let's do it. Have you read Peace Over Pain yet? This short but powerful book reveals how to eliminate chronic pain and or illness faster than any other known therapeutic approach. Download the Peace Over Pain book for only $4.95 and gain instant access to the ebook version, audiobook version, and a video training with Dr. Reese. Go to peaceoverpain.com and start reading or listening right now. This is the information you've been praying for. All right, that's nice. So let's bring on Mark, and uh, we can, I'll introduce Mark, and uh, let's see, let's start the video. Mark, how are you? Good, thank you, and yourself? Oh, I'm very, very good. I wanted to introduce Mark Pelter. And he's a veteran of mindfulness practitioner of 40 years. And he brings a culture of mindfulness and loving kindness to us to help clients grow and live a fulfilled life. So, Mark, thanks for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks for coming on board uh, with the Peace Over Pain Clinic. So um, we needed a mindfulness coach because. You know, as people read in the book, you know, there's we got the nutrition, we got the postural therapy, and then there's mindfulness. And mindfulness arguably is the most difficult out of the three. And so it was imperative to bring someone on board that's going to be able to have sessions. So have sessions with the clients. We do four sessions with the clients. Plus they have someone to reach out to. And I thought Mark was the perfect person. Mark helped me on my journey. So I already tasted the goods. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. so i i think he's you know he's he's gonna help a lot of people yeah and i heard mark on your other podcast inner peace with dr reese you can find that on spotify and um i thought it was a great episode you know i was very intrigued by what he had to say especially a lot of the inner child work that he does so rather than let's talk about him let's let mark talk so mark how you've been in this for 40 years how did you get started in the wellness and mindfulness field? Uh, what drew you to it? Well, um, and also you, you might want to correct your bio of me. It's actually 50 years that I've been involved in it. So I'm, I'll be oh. 73 at the end of the month. And I've been at Congrats. this a long time. And really like uh, most people that um, have life circumstances, um, you decide if you want to stay stuck in it or 
if you're hungry for something else and that hunger might lead you to some places that are helpful and places that are not helpful. And certainly certain types of food might not be helpful, certain types of addictions might not be helpful. But mindfulness and coming to terms with the way we speak to ourselves and what we, our behaviors, and whether the way that we talked with ourselves and our behaviors bring us happiness or misery, we actually have a great deal of control over if we're willing to face one of the difficulties. And that difficulty is that when you choose to change part of your ego, fears annihilation. Fear is mm -hmm. ego death. And it doesn't literally die, but it right, changes right. its status. It no longer is the master of all that is. It's, uh, you know, takes a different subroutine, so to speak, in, in a greater story. Right. Right. You kind of got to put the ego in its place at some point and say, no, 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 no. You're not doing a good job here as the boss. <laughs> Sorry, we're going to have to let you go. You, you can still be on the board of directors. <laughs> But, uh, you know, no more CEO. Sorry, I'm taking over as CEO. All right. And you got to get to that point. Um, and I, I, you know, after 50 years in therapy, so we're talking, you started in the 70s, pretty much. Yes, I met my Buddhist teacher in 1972. Wow. So you've been doing this for a long time. How has your practice evolved over the 50 years and have you found you've needed to take on new, um, new skills and new different methods as the years go on and society changes? Um, so, I mean, I, I can imagine a session with you in 1975 would a bit be a lot different than a session with you in 2022. Definitely. In the beginning, I um, had duped myself into thinking that I could meditate all my problems away. And after a number of years of hitting my head up against the same wall, I had to admit that that wasn't quite working. And ultimately what happened, uh, Joe, is that I had to come to terms with my issues and said it a different way. I had to find peace in how I related with what was showing up in my mind, in my heart, in my life. Mm. And I love the title of Kevin's book, uh, Peace Over Pain. And so... In my training as a Buddhist monk and priest, I was taught, let it go. But the problem is that it just isn't that easy. There are parts of our psychology, part of our mind, our habits, whatever it is, that we really need to work it through. And so I coined this phrase. I don't know where I got it from, but it just surfaced in my mind. And the phrase is, if you can't let it go, work it through. And so out of that hunger to and um, desire to find freedom from needless suffering, I looked and looked. And uh, over time, I learned certain metaphysical tools that actually helped. And uh, of course, like anyone, I like what works and I have no value for what doesn't work. It's, you know, very common, I think, for all of us. So out of that, what I've come to is recognizing that the way that we speak with ourselves makes a world of difference. And also some of the negative chatter, if we don't take it literal mindedly, it actually helps us to see where our emotional needs are. And also we can learn how to nurture those needs and take responsibility for them so that we're not dependent emotionally on other people that might not be available. Right, right, right. So it's, it's about, it's, I would say almost becoming self-sufficient, you know what I mean? Like understanding that you are the master of your mind and thereby the master of your body and thereby the master of your emotions as well, because all of those things stem from what the mind is doing, basically. And, and most of us run around life, letting our mind do what it wants, do its own thing. And that sometimes leads us down, you know, the wrong garden path there. And uh, we don't achieve the life that we really desire in our hearts. You know, some of the 
uh, metaphors I like come from the theater industry, motion picture industry. And I was never involved in Hollywood and that kind of thing. Uh, but I like the idea of central casting. And so, you know, they're what's uh, created those parts of ourself. They may have value, but not in that specific role. And so we want to take them off the set and employ a different part that's actually more functional in that specific area and save this part for another place. For example, uh, the critic. And I know we're going to get into the victim, but let's take a look at the critic for a moment. The, the critic actually knows what didn't happen. Mm -hmm. However, they, that knowledge of being able to identify what didn't happen was actually present before it happened. So they actually need to be promoted to a scout position rather than the, um, the critic on the tail end of it because that's where they could serve you the best. Oh, so it's kind of reorganizing <laughs> your, your different parts. Like, like I said, the board of directors, right? So it's like shifting seats on the board of directors, moving them to different positions. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Cause like you said, there's some parts of us, even though we may look at them as negative, that might actually have some value because actually otherwise they wouldn't have existed they wouldn't exist like they worked once you know what i mean and then now oh they work once you know how the mind is let's try it all the time and it it becomes a pattern um so i i really like that i really really like that a lot yeah so we were talking about victimhood and the victim mentality and you know that's been identified i guess uh in the book as one of the poor four um you know, mental behaviors. But again, you just you just named another one. So there are more. But let's uh, let's talk about victim mentality and how that comes about and, and how you can change it, you know, what you can do about it. Well, you know, there, there are places that originate um, just from our life circumstances. And we in our growing up years, you know, especially in our formative years, first three years of life, most of our personality is intact by the time we're three years of age, and certainly by five. And so then there are defining moments in life, which are traumas that we live through, hopefully we live through. And those traumas and how we relate with what the elements of that trauma are, either reinforce or they tweak our personality. We take a different position in life, but the underlying basics of who we are are intact. So for example, let's say if your mother or father was a victim, uh, the victim mentality, right. and our personality may be modeled after one parent more than another. And so we may have absorbed it just from the psychological uh, environment that we were raised in. And there may be circumstances uh, that we were reinforced for certain behaviors. And psychologically, we do need a certain type of reinforcement. Now, in terms of mindfulness training over time, you learn other ways to reinforce the parts of you that you want to be the more dominant, um, you know, have greater roles in the play of consciousness and the play of your life. But the victim is always blaming outwardly. And what I like to do is I like to use my hand as a, as a metaphor. So one finger points out and blame, but you turn your hand over and there's three fingers pointing back. So if the pronouns me, myself, or I are in the blaming, I was there too. What was my part of this? Mm -hmm. And so that's where we start to open things up and look toward healing rather than being stuck in that pattern. So psychologically, this pattern of victimization of reinforcing this idea we need first of all we catch it or someone says why is it you're always the victim and that's just like oh my god you know what do you mean <laughs> like a slap in the face or a bucket of cold water but someone brings it to mind or like in kevin's book it's it's there and we bring it out in the coaching sessions what about the victim uh and it may come out a certain pattern so then we talk about that pattern and how they're relating with it. 
And it's the how they're relating to those parts of their emotional anatomy that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, the word that I like you said, uh, emotional independence, I think. I like the word emotional sovereignty. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's really, that's that's a good one. So now in your practice, um, I'm sure you get people who like, let's say Kevin came to you, he was already on a certain level of awareness, but I'm sure you get people who are baseline starting right at the bottom, not quite understanding why the heck their life is so screwed up. What's the first thing you kind of have to get people to realize to get them like we're talking about a beginner somebody who comes to you and you know they, they they don't really know anything about mindfulness well there may be a number of things it, it kind of depends on how they came to me a, a lot of people come to me because they're going through a, a severe trauma and trauma is one of the loss of any kind are causes of something called the dark night of the soul right and I'm one of those people, it's um, that, oh, as a last resort, you know, give Mark a call, give it a try, a last resort. <laughs> and so then we get down to, you know, the bare bones of it, which is um, taking a look at unresolved emotional issues. And some of the work I do is with uh, anger work and actually working through those energies until there's no anger left no no unresolved resentment so that's one way people come to me uh, another way that often people come to me it has to do with negative self-talk and somewhere in the victim at least even though we're blaming others that there's that negative talk that's going on in our mind and so then we might take a look at the negativity that's the the blaming of other, other blaming and start to take a look at well what what was your what did you have a part in it and so one of the metaphysical tools that i like to use although it does take a few sessions to go all the way through it is a process of self-forgiveness and part of what i learned joe is that the idea of forgive and forget it never worked for anybody i know and it never worked for me but the thing that does help is to forgive and learn. What don't I want to do again? What do I want to do in its place? And like you said earlier, to um, really swap out different parts of yourself and do what works rather than what doesn't work. Right, right. And, and I guess, like you said, you're the last resort. I think people like, you know, we talk about hitting a bottom in substance abuse. I think people have to hit in a, bo uh, in a bottom, an emotional bottom, uh, even, even though they may have been going to typical normal therapy for years and it's not working. I think they have to just hit an emotional bottom before they're willing to really, really change, you know, because a lot of people get resistance when you tell them, oh, you're, you know, you're responsible for everything in your life. You know what I mean? That's like a hard thing for people to accept. Like everything that happens to you is your fault, you know, <laughs> and you created that somewhere in, in your psyche or in your consciousness. And I think that that's a hard thing for people to, um, you know, to realize. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a very powerful understanding. Uh, just right. take it a little bit farther than what you said, Joe. If, if a person is willing to consider that they chose their parents and the circumstances that they were born into and their life circumstances gave them the raw materials from which they could grow and they take the bull by the horns and they use that raw materials from which to grow, it opens up a whole new life for them. That That's just the past. And then there's a whole, you know, I've got goosebumps all over. I tend to do that when I get <laughs> like that. But, you know, it creates a whole new life for them that they um, can create moment to moment. Right, right. And that's kind of, it's an amazing realization. And especially when you start to see coming in, into reality, into your life, once you start practicing, practicing it seriously, 
And I think people need to understand, I know for me, and I know even for Kevin, this, and I'm sure for you, this is a process. This is a lifelong process. This is almost why we're here is to evolve to as high, you know, to as much of a level as you can during whatever time you have here. That's why a lot of some people in some circles call it an ascension process, right? Right. Like a, you know, going, you climb in a ladder almost. It's a, there's almost levels of consciousness. Right. It's not if, something. If, if only we could just flip the switch and be uh, enlightened, you know, but it, I, it's such a, a process of deprogramming. Yeah. And, and I think people need to understand that. Unfortunately, we live in a quick fix society, you know, where they think if they go on an app, you know, they're going to get enlightened, you know, um, but it's, it's much, much more than that. I mean, I know. And first thing is you almost got to have that awakening. You almost have to have that moment where you're snapped out of quote unquote, the matrix there for a minute. And you get that, um, you get that view, you know, whether you want it or not, you get that watcher view. Off, even if it's for a moment and that's when your ascension process i mean you, it does happen before that but that's when it really starts to take off and i think that's where you have to cultivate it you know and make sure you just continue on the path but you're not going to sit down and meditate under a bodhi tree for a couple of days and become enlightened and i think people need to understand that well even, know, the, even the buddha was on quite a long journey yeah and- <laughs> Um, and then when he went to Bodh Gaya, it was, uh, he really made a vow, enlightenment or death. And it was a total commitment. There was 40 days and 40 nights and awakening, having his uh, awakening on the 40th of the morning as, as the morning star rose is how it's written. Um, but his awakening was to the truth that there is suffering. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that gets distinguished is that there's two types of suffering. One type of suffering is needless. And the other one is inevitable. The inevitable suffering, of course, is let's say you have a little kitty and mostly you're going to outlive your kitty. And let's say you love your kitty and you tend for it. You like comforting your kitty and the way that the kitty sits in your lap, all those things, you have all those associations. But when the kitty dies, of course, you're going to feel some sorrow. Right. Right. It's just like any other loss, you know, and, um, you know, I know you mentioned dark night of the soul earlier, and you know that can be uh, triggered by trauma. And I'm, is that something that you work with people on? Definitely, yes. Definitely, yeah. And, and the dark night of the soul, believe it or not, is really the initiation into the awakening of the heart. Right. Right. So, absolutely that's true all right so mark how does people reach you uh do you have any books out do you have a website i do uh i wrote a book that's a workbook for the cultivation of loving kindness it's called choosing what's chosen you and i i use that in uh i not teaching any classes presently uh but i do have some things i do online i have a, a a complimentary meditation class on Monday night uh, from six to seven o'clock Pacific time. And also I have a community meeting on Tuesday night, also from six to seven o'clock Pacific time. Um, Let's see, I have a website. It's uh, artofconnectionnow.com. Art of Connection Now is one as one word. And it has blog posts and different things on there. Oh, very, very cool. All right. So artofconnection.com. Mark, welcome to the team. Um, We're really looking forward. I'm sure uh, all of our clients are. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. It was very, very enlightening. And I'm I'm looking forward to talking to you more and uh, hearing from you more. So uh, much appreciated, Mark. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. Always a pleasure. Okay, Kevin, I guess we're going to get into questions. Mark, you can hang out if you want. Um, We're going to get into questions. But before that, let's hear a little word. Have you read Peace Over Pain yet? This short but powerful book reveals how to eliminate chronic pain and or illness faster than any other known therapeutic approach. 
Download the Peace Over Pain book for only $4.95 and gain instant access to the ebook version, audiobook version, and a video training with Dr. Reese. Go to peaceoverpain.com and start reading or listening right now. This is the information you've been praying for. Well, we got that twice, but that's okay. All right. So hey, we have our book twice. Yeah. I mean, you know, we already, they already know that uh, we're asking questions. So, okay. I got one here. This one just came in. Hold on. Wrong one. Uh, this one just came in. From Tina. Yeah. Uh, Tina asks, what do you think about psychedelic therapy? It's good that we got you both on. What do you think about psychedelic therapy? And this just came in today. Well, I, it's not the end all be all, that's for sure. It might give you a glimpse into something, an insight, if you will, but it, it does not replace taking responsibility and, and doing mindfulness training. Yeah, I agree. They're doing studies on it now. Matter of fact, right in our own Yale here, and um, so these are medical studies, and I think that's what he's talking about. I don't think he's talking about going on a Sunday afternoon and eating a gram of mushrooms. I think it's more about the studies that they're doing and using psilocybin as a therapeutic drug. And what they found is pretty much what you're talking about. What it is able to do is get you into that state where you, you kind of realize, you know, the overall picture and you, then you, you start taking responsibility for your thoughts because being in that state obviously raises you to a higher level of consciousness. Well, one of my, one of the people I studied a lot on my journey, Mark is probably familiar because he's from the same somewhat era is Ram Das, and Ram Das studied the heck out of all this. I mean, and you know, he, he let it go at some point. Cause it was like, yeah. it's, it's not the end all be all. It's just it, I, I think it can only take you so far. Absolutely. You okay. know what I mean? It's a good opener. And, and again, it's subject to abuse. If you abuse it, it, it becomes a door closer just like anything else, you know? Yeah. And people, yeah. people are big into ayahuasca now, you know? And right. And DMT. It'll, it'll, it'll give you like a dark night of the soul for an hour. <laughs> basically that's kind of what it does you know um i've never done it <laughs> myself i i have dabbled in psychedelics um but not since i was like oof, you know we're talking back in the 80s but yeah no i've never i mean i know that they've had some success i know people who do this mushroom uh, psilocybin therapy can be depression free for months at a time so hey look anything's better than the SSRIs and whatever they're giving people now. So if they can find things like psilocybin and cannabis to help people rather than all these pharmaceuticals, I'm all for it. <laughs> because, you know, because obviously what they're doing is not helping people. Okay, so Kevin, before we went to the next question, you got a really, really nice comment on Facebook the other day, and I wanted to read. It's from a Heather Rose. It says, Kevin, I just want to thank you for being you. I found you and Dr. M, I think that's Dr. Morrissey, years ago when I needed you. For the last six months, I've been on the fence about introducing meat back into my diet and now seem pulled to watch some of your newer material. The fact that you have added some animal products back into your life and are still healing people gives me sort of a green light in several areas to start doing the same. Interesting also how I started using ghee again about two months ago and heard you mention that you use it as well. The universe always sends us in the right direction at the right time. I appreciate how much you help others, how you evolve and grow, aren't afraid to change direction and how you share your knowledge and experience. Thanks. And that's from Heather Rose. I hope I didn't embarrass you there, but you know, I wanted to, you know, you know, give shout outs to people who give shout outs to us, you know, so it's important. Thank you you mention her on the air. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can't be afraid to, 
pivot. Yeah. What, one of one of my uh, associates once said, you know, it, it's interesting how when you get compliments from people, you can sort of see what direction they're, you can sort of put them in different categories, right? But one time associate of mine gave me a compliment that was unlike anything in, in these categories. He said, it's unbelievable how much and how easily you can pivot. <laughs> and, and so let, let that be my message for the world. You know, you, you got to pivot. You got to pivot. You, you, yeah. you don't stop. You just pivot. Take you the know? shot from another angle. Yeah, that's all. But you don't yeah. stop. You don't necessarily quit. You just pivot. I like that. I like that metaphor. And, and he's right. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's talk about this. John on Facebook. I have someone in my life that really triggers me. What should I do? Be aware of it. Be very, very aware of it. And I, I think since we have Mark, I'll pass that over to him. Well, it's a really important question, Joe and Kevin. Uh, first of all, to recognize your pattern. And, uh, you know, in the ancient scriptures in Buddhism, it says, um, when the causes of suffering don't arise, suffering doesn't arise. And so part of how I've really worked on what does that mean for the causes? So there are indicators that help you to see what will cause you to suffer. Because when you get triggered, the person that does the most violence to is yourself. And so if you look at, you start to scroll backward, what, what is that trigger? Most of the time, those triggers were caused by trauma of some type, and they were a reaction formation relative to that trauma. And then when we project that out onto others, it's the tone and manner of what they spoke. It, if we're speaking with them, it may be the cigar that they smoked. It may have olfactory parts to it. Th these triggers can have multiple different indicators. But when you put them together and you take a look at it, what happened is that we have a sensitivity, EQ, emotional intelligence. And what got impacted is our feelings not necessarily intentionally. Nevertheless, our feelings got impacted. So what I like to do in my own life and teach other people is take a moment just to feel what you're feeling. Maybe you give yourself a timeout. I need to think about that. And you go away and you just let your what you're feeling come all the way through you. When you're back to a place of, uh, I'll say, a, give a fancy word, homeostasis, uh, stability emotional stability then the a good question to ask the other person is can you please help me understand what you meant by what you said because our emotional programming tweaks our mind to think that we know what they meant and that's where the biggest mistake is mm. in the 120 day program we have there's a whole module on this exercise of taking a five minute meeting. So there's the, the time out you speak of. Take a five minute meeting with yourself. And um, I like this concept because of course, meetings are huge in, in uh, Alcohol Anonymous and the 12 steps and all that. But the problem with that, from my perspective, is that you're constantly relying on other people. So by taking a five minute meeting, you're now becoming reliable on yourself. And I even tell people to literally set an alarm on your phone. Like, okay, I got to take a five minute meeting. Okay. And literally do it and, and get inside. And then when you hear that alarm, beep, 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 beep. Right. It's over. Right. Go on with your day. And I think, Mark, what you said is, is so correct that these are these triggers that come up today were installed way in the past. You know, you could be looking at a person who just reminds you of somebody from the past and that triggers you now. Or they could have a behavior of somebody who 
you knew from the past who harmed you, or like you say, caused trouble. You, sometimes you really have to dig deep to figure out why does this person trigger? What is it about his behavior that reminds me of something that happened from my past years ago? You know, and I think that's what you're trying to remind. Don't think this is like, this is stuff that's been in there a while. And sometimes oh, yeah. you, you have to dig it out. You know? Programming, programming. <laughs> And another part of mindfulness training that I like is using certain mantras, like um, that's them and that's their reality and that's how they see it. This is me and this is the re my reality that I claim. And so too, I call it separating and differentiating. You're entitled to be yourself. They're entitled to be themselves. Right, right. Because you want the same rights. You want people to respect you. You want people to let you be who you are. You have to give the same rights to everyone else or they're going to, you know, they're not going to give them to you. So there you go. That's your triggers. Um, okay. Now here's a different, this goes in a little different direction here, Kevin. Shana on IG wants to know, I have acne on my face and I get headaches. Are they connected? More than likely, yes. More than likely because... Yeah, I'd have to see her pictures, but if she has cervical flexion, that means her, her, the top of her spine, her neck is like this, right? And then you got the head over here, and so there's not drainage happening. So if oh. there's not drainage happening, then you we can get acne there, um, and then we can get headaches. So that's a big connection that I see with a lot of people, but it could also be a nutritional deficiency as well such as an essential fatty acid deficiency uh, or poor four foods, right? Eating poor four food. Yep. Creating inflammation. Both of but, those can give you a head, you know, gluten can give you both of those things. But I'd be willing to bet if we saw her pictures that she would have a forward head. I'd be willing so, to bet. Very interesting. People don't realize, you know, they spend all this money on, on these treatments for acne and all these things and, and they don't realize that it could be a simple set of exercises that could okay, change your life. It's also important to note that when people have acne on their forehead, a lot of times that's a blood sugar issue. And if people have acne on their cheeks and face, that's typically a gut issue. If people have rashes on their arms and legs, that's typically an, an immune issue. So we do know there are markers of symptomology that can tell us what's going on that, you know, it's not the end all be all. Like I was saying in my interview with Ryan Alexander, which just came out yesterday, by I way, saw that. Wants to listen to that. I, to I talk that. about, it's really hard to pinpoint the root cause of things sometimes. Mm -hmm. You and have so to that's go through why, a couple things. That's why at the Peace Over Pain Clinic, we go after multiple things at the same time. Well, right. And I think it's because the Peace Over Pain Clinic covers all different areas. So it's like it's more prevention than anything else. So let's get you on the baseline first and then go from there. So to me, it's more like preventative. If you do these things, then things are going to change for you and things are going to get better for you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, OK, well, very, very good. So now we know they are connected. Okay, here's one from Aaron on Facebook. How do I eat cleaner on a lower budget? How do I eat cleaner on a lower budget? Okay, well- What's cleaner, first of all? Let's define cleaner. Yeah, we would have to work out what cleaner is. I, I mean, from, from our perspective, cleaner would be just staying off of the poor for food. And eating whole foods. Yeah, eating foods that are one ingredient. Right? right you know an avocado an apple or some chicken breast that's one ingredient it's not junk right and that doesn't include seasonings i want people to know that they can they can you know put some seasonings on it or even create a nice sauce or whatever as long as it doesn't have oil you know but right the main ingredient should be a whole food but you know like right now food is expensive you know, if, if you go get a steak, you're, you're looking at a $30 steak, perhaps. I mean, it's, it's up there right now, but you can get ground beef. 
which is very affordable. And you can get, you know, you can get watermelon, which is very affordable. You can get, you know, there, there's tons of options. So it doesn't have to be super expensive, but I think that eating whole foods will come out to more than eating junk food. Because junk food is so inexpensive. You know, you can get a big bag of uh, some sort of cheese concoction, you know, Doritos or cheese puffs or something. You can get a big bag, three bucks. And that big bag will feed three people for three bucks. But there's nothing good about it. And so that's just going to contribute to a slow deterioration of the body, which is going to cost you more money in the long run anyway. Now, how about like dried beans, dried peas? They, they tend to be very inexpensive and you can make a lot of things like soups sure. and dips with them. Even so, rice, rice is inexpensive. I know you don't recommend eating a ton of it, but if you don't have gut issues, right, rice is okay. Yeah, if, you're, if you follow our recommendation of getting a pressure cooker, which will cost you about 150 bucks, but that will last you 10 years and you can buy, like you just said, inexpensive dried beans and dried rice. When you buy the dried versions, they're much cheaper and you can throw them in the pressure cooker. It'll take you an hour or two to cook it, but then you have it for the week and you can put it in Tupperware. And so when you plan like that, the pressure cooker becomes a very good tool for eating whole food and bringing your expenses down right i think that yeah that is a good one the beans the rice and the dried versions much cheaper than even cans and i think they last sure i mean if you go in my basement there's a lot of dried (laughs) beans and and rice because it's survival food yeah and i don't want it to be in cans i'd rather it be dry so and it's an inexpensive way to have emergency food for that'll last you 10 years. And, and, and depending on where you live, there's always the option to grow a few veggies. You don't have to have a giant garden, but you grow some veggies that you like yep. a tomato plant, a pepper plant, a couple of things that you like and you grow them yourself. And there's also the option. Look, you can go to a grocery store and one of the biggest things that they give away is produce because if it doesn't look good, if it's ugly, you know, uh, one of the things that they'll give away for free is produce and of course bread, but you don't want that. The most popular <laughs> fruit in the world, you might be surprised to know, is the cheapest fruit in the world, which is a banana. Yes. Bananas are extremely inexpensive. You can buy an organic banana for like 40 cents. Right. Oranges are fairly cheap too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there are ways as long as eating whole foods, I think is the best way that you can go on a budget, you know, because you can buy large amounts of it and get a ton on rather than buying one portion in a box, you know what I mean? So I yeah, think and then, that's, and then ground beef is a great way to, if you, if you, if you are a meat eater, ground beef is going to be your cheapest way because, you know, again, a ribeye is going to be 25, yeah, 30 bucks. It's, it's ridiculous these days. You can't, you can't eat meat like you used to anymore. Yeah. You know? But, but ground beef, especially if it's not grass fed is only going to be five bucks for, a, for a, at least for a pound, at least for a maybe. Pound. Even, yeah. yeah. And you can divide that up. You don't have to make burgers, you know, just, you can put it in something else just with a few vegetables, you know, you don't need a ton of it to get the right amount of protein. So throw it in the pressure cooker. Right. Exactly. Right. With veggies and things like that. You make a nice uh, stew there. Okay. Kevin, we're almost out of time here, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, You got any final words before we go? No. Okay. I do visit peaceoverpain.com. Join our Facebook group. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Mark, you have anything to say before we go uh, say goodbye? 
Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to working with people that come into the clinic and being of service to everyone. All right. Yeah, All right. Just, I do have a final word. It just okay. surface. We just started advertising on Friday. Mm. So it's going to be an interesting journey to see new people coming into the Facebook group and, and, you know, um, it's just an interesting journey of finding the right people. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. The more the we're not, we're not trying to bring in people that are going to throw tomatoes at us. Right. <laughs> no, we want people to eat what we're putting out on the plate. <laughs> right. And, and that's just better for us and that's better for them. And, and, to create a healthy, happy relationship between That's our right. little our little community that we're growing. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks to Coach Amber. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kevin. Take care. Now, remember, peace over pain. Thanks for watching the Peace Over Pain podcast live inside our clinic's Facebook group. Be sure to submit a question or comment for next week's show at peaceoverpain.com. Also, perform some goodwill and tell a friend in pain that you found their solution. Refer them to the Peace Over Pain podcast and the Peace Over Pain book and help them move closer to their miracle.